All right, so ArcGIS notebooks within Arc, or using Python notebooks within ArcGIS Enterprise. The first thing to know is that there's two different options. The first is just using the ArcGIS API for Python, which uses open source Jupyter. It's been available for a couple years now, so you can continue to use that. Then there's ArcGIS notebooks, which is brand new, oops, which is brand new and is coming out in just a few weeks with ArcGIS Enterprise 10.7. So both of these options will continue to exist. Looking at the images, you can see how with ArcGIS Notebooks, we've incorporated more of the GIS tools in there. So you have the ability to search for data, analysis tools, local file sharing, whereas with the standalone ArcGIS API for Python, you just have the Jupyter interface. So let's go over a couple of these differences, just so you know, because these are brand new. Um, so the ArcGIS API for Python, like I said, connects to an external Jupyter server. This is something you set up, you can run it on your desktop, that's how that works. Whereas ArcGIS Notebooks truly is ArcGIS technology. So at 10.7, we have Notebook Server, and at the end of this presentation, I will show our roadmap on the future integrations with other ArcGIS products. The ArcGIS API for Python can only use ArcPy when it's used with ArcGIS Pro. And that ArcPy license is tied to the Pro license. So if you license that for single use, just you, that means you would be breaking your license agreement to open it up to everyone in your organization. Whereas with ArcGIS Notebooks, the ArcPy is bound to the Notebook Server Advanced license. You are, can assign those privileges to anyone in your organization. The ArcGIS API for Python is really designed for individuals. It's not that teams can't use it. It's just that it is an ideal fit for if you're working on your workstation, you're doing your workflows, um, and mo mostly that's because of the sharing. When we juxtapose that to ArcGIS Notebooks. So ArcGIS Notebooks is really designed for that organizational use. So all of your libraries stay synchronized across the entire organization. So that's really what I'm getting at there. Not only is it easy to share because it's portal items, it's that all of your libraries, whatever frameworks you've brought in, you create what's called a notebook runtime. And this is something you do through the admin API. That's where you define all of the libraries that you want out of the box. We will give you the notebook runtimes for whatever you license, and then you are ready to start using it. And we'll go into that a little bit later. And you can work with both, so you don't necessarily have to choose. If you're using the ArcGIS API for Python today, you can continue to use it, and you can begin to explore ArcGIS notebooks. So kind of the way that you would use both together is, and I'm talking about going back and forth between different environments. Obviously, the Python API is integrated into notebooks, so it's not that you have to go back and forth. So the standard uh, standalone ArcGIS, uh, standalone Python API, you can import your IPy and B files into Notebook Server. So that gets you into this new environment, or if you're still working with others in different organizations, different divisions, or just people with different standalone Jupyter notebooks, you can bring in their IPy and B files. You also can download any ArcGIS notebook as an IPy and B file, which means that you can take whatever work you're doing wherever you might need it to go. Now, there are some things to keep in mind when you do this. ArcGIS notebooks are designed to work within the ArcGIS notebook ecosystem. So if you are using ArcPy, remember that's tied to your notebook license, so you, that won't carry over. If you, have, if you need to access um, credentials, ArcGIS Notebooks has a special way that we handle credentials, and you see that in that last line there. It's the GIS equals GIS home. This is how we authenticate with who you are in the organization. So if I were to share a notebook with my buddy Bill, who's in the back there, I could do that. And when I give Bill the notebook, the notebook will authenticate with Bill's permission. So if I'm an administrator and I write an administrative notebook and I share it with Bill, who's not an administrator, he would not be able to do the administrative things. He could run the other cells, but those administrative privileges he wouldn't have. The notebook enforces that. That's to give you guys an extra layer of security. So if you're going from a standalone ArcGIS API for Python into the notebook server world, what you'll want to do 
is take out any of those clear text credentials that you might have in there. The Python API has numerous ways you don't have to put clear text, but I know some people still like to just go ahead and enter those online or enterprise credentials right on in there. So use the GIS equals GIS home. This is in the help documentation, so you don't have to memorize it. Then there's a couple key differences. So I like to think of these as the ArcGIS notebooks extras. So what they are is all the integrated toolbars. The only way you get that drag and drop sort of add data, add tools experience is through ArcGIS notebooks. The identity-based access that notebooks respects who you are and what privileges you've been granted within ArcGIS notebooks. Notebooks are stored as portal items. So that means they have their full first class citizens of the portal. You can look at their item details page. You can mark them as authoritative or deprecated. You can treat them just like any other item. You have the ability to script using ArcPy independent of ArcGIS desktop. This is really cool because with a lot of people using ArcPy with ArcGIS server, they're just serving up tools that they've built with ArcPy. They're not opening up a wide scripting environment for people to come and write their own custom code using ArcPy. But with notebooks, you could. And you also have that easier sharing. One, it's right there in the UI. Just click that share button and you're done. Or you can share these in 1071 through distributed collaboration. Um, so lots of options for that. So now let's take a look at an ArcGIS notebook server deployment. Just log in here real quick. Okay, so you saw this from the plenary. Oh, you see nothing. And no, I don't want to print this. I always do that. There we go. Now you saw this in the plenary. Thank you right here, Heather, my new friend, Heather. All right, so you saw this in the plenary, you have the notebook option. Now, the only people who see the notebook option are the people who can create notebooks. Other people that do not have the ability to create notebooks can still be shared the item, but this toolbar right here takes you straight into the notebook. That is why non-notebook creators cannot access it. It would just be teasing them. Okay, so what's happening while this is loading? Because you might notice, hey, that takes like a couple seconds. Why does it do that? What is happening behind the scenes is we are spinning up a Docker container just for you. Every notebook you create in that session is put in your Docker container. So you have one Docker container, multiple open notebooks. How many notebooks can you put in your container will depend on what you're doing with them. Lightweight administrative notebooks, you can probably fit a whole bunch. Deep learning, where you're consuming a lot of resources, probably not so many. We'll get into the admin API in a second where I can show you some of how you can change settings for your containers and change defaults. Um, but first, I wanted to walk through a couple features you did not get to see in the plenary. So here you can see this first cell, my GIS equals GIS home is authenticating as me. You saw the ability to add data but what you didn't get to see was the ability to look for distributed collaboration content. So this means that this item was shared to my organization through distributed collaboration, and I can still add it in, which first, since this is a space-time cube, I'll import, sorry. Okay, so we imported the web scene, and now let's bring this in. Oh, that's not the space-time cube. That's not what I want. That's just the data behind it. Let's bring in this one. All right. So here you can see that what this is doing is bringing in the 3D space-time cube that was shared to me through distributed collaboration. So it's already switched into a 3D mode and I could begin to zoom around in here. I could switch so that I can toggle this around. And of course, I can still interact with the data here. We have a sample notebook in the gallery. It's a Boston crime one, but it walks you through how you can create a space-time cube within a notebook. 
So it's not just that you can bring these visualizations in, it's that you can actually create them in the notebook experience itself. So you're not limited to looking at data or analysis results in just 2D. So that was a little bit on data. You already saw the analysis tools, so there's, it, you just have the options there. The next thing that you didn't get to see was this ability to bring in local data. So a lot of data scientists still like to work with local files. And even if you're a GIS analyst or a business analyst or no matter what your title is, odds are at some point you've gone to the internet and you have found some piece of data that you would like to look at. Well, you don't have to worry about publishing it and going through that workflow just so that you can explore it. ArcGIS Notebooks allows you to bring in local data from your computer with a simple upload. You can see that all of the data that I've brought in previously is here. This is my own private workbench. This is for me, no one else can see this. Any notebook that I create or open, I have access to the data in my workbench. It will stay there until I delete it. So if I wanted to choose a file here, I can go, I think I probably have a CSV in my download somewhere. Let's see, crime reports. That sounds like a good CSV to bring in. So I'll upload it. At 10.7, we unfortunately don't have anything that tells you when this is uploaded, so you'll just sit here. I actually believe this CSV is gigantic now that I think about it because it is an entire year of crime, and apparently as a society, we like to commit crimes. So this will continue. We'll come back here and check on it in a little bit. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. We don't have time to wait for my ginormous crime data set. Uh, let's look at the items details page. So we'll save this real quick. Notebook 38, great. Let's go to content. Here's untitled Notebook 38 that we were just in. Here I have an items details page where I could fill out all of the information that I would want this notebook to have so that people could make sense of this. Because I don't expect that even myself tomorrow would remember what on earth I was doing in untitled Notebook 38. So give it a useful name, give it a thumbnail, give it a description, provide any terms of use, and really let's move this green item information bar all the way over to high. And if you are a type of personality like myself that really likes to strive for that 100%, it is hard to do that and I have let the team know, so don't worry. But still, let's try. You might not get to 100%. So what you'll see what you can do here is you can open the notebook. I'm not gonna do that, we just saw it. We could download the notebook. That'll give me a pi IPI and B file. I could share it with others. I'm not gonna do that right now. And I can preview it. Now this is an important thing to keep in mind because remember, you can share notebooks with people who cannot create them. So in ArcGIS Enterprise, you have viewers. Viewers can view things. Well, what a viewer could do is preview this and see how it has all the outputs of my cells. So if I had something in here where I did not want someone to see what I was doing, then I should not share it with them. And that's the thing. We had a big meeting where we were thinking, how do we do this? What do we want to secure it? And then we realized, oh, you just don't share it. That's what you do. You just, yeah, don't share it. So keep in mind, you have the previews. You'll see there. You'll notice that um, my maps did not draw in the previews. We have some workarounds on how to make that happen. For our samples, we have a special workflow that we follow. I'll be publishing a blog where we can talk through how to do that. And I believe the Python API team will be putting something in their GitHub repo as well. So then we go to the settings. Because this is a true portal item, we still have the lovely new features that came in at, I believe, 1061 to mark as authoritative or deprecated. This is going to be really convenient as you're sharing notebooks with others because what happens is, let's say I create a notebook and I share it with my brand new friend Heather here who let me know that my screen was not displaying. Well, when I give this notebook to Heather, Heather can open it and view it. She can run all the cells. But at the moment that she adds new code to this notebook, then a new item is created just for Heather. That is when the change happens. So you don't have to necessarily go through a production of doing this. If you walk through the create workflow, it'll give you this all up front and I'll show you that in just a second. But there's a couple other things that I wanted to show you in here. Um, I will go into a notebook setting. Hmm. Okay, so let's go into one of our samples for this. 
you can access samples two different ways. So we will use the create workflow so that we can see, experience this together. Now, and then we'll go see the other one. So from the create, I can create a notebook. This will allow me to browse all of the samples that I have. So here's some administration ones, then I get into some analytics ones. Here's that crime one that shows me how to make a space time cube. I hit next and it'll walk me through entering a title, tag, summary, and what folder I would like to put it in. So let's just say space time, space time. That looks like street, that's a terrible tag. I don't recommend that tag, but let's add that notebook. So that was a simple workflow of how I could use the create workflow to create either a blank notebook or a sample. Um, the other way is right here. I could click this little button that says samples. It'll launch a new tab that takes me to the gallery that I could change to grid view. I could do my reverse alphabetical sort. And then you see all the analytical ones first. Um, in a future release, we'll have categories in here as well, so that way you can more easily find the category of notebook that you are looking for. But let's go back to our content. So here you see where the concept of a notebook runtime starts getting introduced. I could change this notebook runtime to standard or advanced. And in just a second, don't worry, I'll get to what those are. This is also where if you create custom notebook environments where you added a new library in that wasn't there before, um, you would see your runtimes listed here too, and you could pick those. So let's jump back into our slides and continue on. Good. Okay, so here's some fast facts about RTS Notebook Server. It uses Docker. So that is important. Now the Docker here is really to sandbox your code, to keep your resources for you and not to be stolen by someone else in your organization. Um, and by stolen, I just simply mean somebody runs something really intensive, you don't want it eating your resources. So no, that's why we're using Docker. Notebook Server is available on both Windows and Linux. But no matter which operating system you choose, when you configure Docker, always, always, always use Linux containers. For the Windows folks in the audience, Docker tries to be really helpful and detect that your OS is Windows and will remind you very conveniently, hey, would you like to switch to Windows containers? Don't do it. Notebook Server does not like Windows containers because it's the way that Arc Objects, which is the foundation, the lifeblood of so many things, is built. So don't use the Linux container. You as an end user will not notice the difference here, but it's what the system needs. We do support GPU. At 10.7, it is Linux only. So if you need GPU infrastructure, that's something you get on your own. You have your GPU infrastructure. There'll be one extra post install step for you to follow, which is to get the CUDA libraries from the NVIDIA because they do not, at this point, let us, to distrib let us distribute it for them, but we're working on it. Maybe if you know anyone at NVIDIA, let them say, hey, hey, maybe share those libraries. We are working on it. At 10.7.1, we're looking at bringing in GPU support for Windows. Um, the only reason that you would, we wouldn't do that is if we hit some technological road bump, but we are working hard on that. When it comes to installing Notebook Server, there is an, an executable, so you're not going to be lost in the dark. There's also options for silent installs if that's more your speed. If you're someone who's already in the cloud, then you can deploy on AWS or Azure or really any cloud. Um, but we package the notebook, so, uh, notebook server pieces with our machine images for both AWS and Azure. You won't see it in the cloud builder or the cloud formation template until 10.7, but it is coming in there. So once it's in there, you'll have the full wizard-like experience, depending on which one you're choosing, that you um, are used to working with. Okay, this is a little more on the licensing side. Notebook Server is a server licensing role. So you, if you have ArcGIS Enterprise, you may be familiar with this concept of server licensing roles. You can see the, the, the original licensing roles up there, GIS, Image, GeoEvent, GeoAnalytics, 
And now the new kid on the block, notebooks. So notebook server is not like its siblings. The, what makes it not like its siblings is it has different system requirements because of the Docker and different prerequisites because of the Docker mostly. Thus I say Docker. And we've already gone over, this is to sandbox your code environment. This is not containerization for DevOps, which many people may be w waiting for and hoping for and be well aware that this is a project that enterprise team is developing. Now, will notebook ser server ever be truly fully containerized? Sure, but the rest of ArcGIS Enterprise has to go first, at least the base deployment. So just wait a couple, I hear only a year, but I would say a year or two. Okay, notebook server licensing. You've heard me throw around the term standard and advanced and what is this? So notebook server has two different levels, standard and advanced and ArcPy is the only technical difference between the two. Now, the licensing difference is that there is a price difference. Standard is available at no additional cost, and you can have unlimited cores of it. So as much as you want, as much as you need, there you go. This is because for those machine learning or deep learning workflows, you may need to scale. And so we want to be able to help you do that. If you're looking at advanced and you say, I really do need ArcPy though, how much would that cost in my organization? Ask your account manager. Every organization has different agreements and they don't trust me with such information. I just would tell everyone. That's why I don't, oh, I, my badge is red here. And it wouldn't make sense to non-Esri people. Okay, now, you must have ArcJS Enterprise. So notebook server levels, standard and advanced, totally separate than your enterprise standard and advanced. And this can trip you up. You say, oh, standard advanced, standard advanced, they're the same, they go together. Mm -mm. All you need to use notebook server is ArcGIS Enterprise. You need to have that base deployment set up so that you can federate your notebook server in. But I do not care which version of notebook server or of ArcGIS Enterprise you have. So you could have ArcGIS Enterprise advanced and say, I would just like the free one, please perfectly okay. You could have ArcGIS Enterprise Standard and say, I would like that advanced one, por favor, and we will happily give you that. It is up to you. Okay, moving on to the admin API. So the admin API allows you to do a lot of different things. You can create custom notebook runtimes. You can modify your container specs. So this is really important because if you are trying to work through workflows and you're feeling like this isn't doing anything for me, what is the deal? Odds are you probably have your container set to be super tiny. So you should look it up in that. Um, so things that you can increase or decrease are things like RAM, CPU, shared memory, and your web, web socket size. You can terminate containers from there. So if you're an administrator, you can terminate anyone's container. I think you should maybe find out if they're doing anything first, but you know, you, you always could just terminate it. As a user, if you access the admin API, you can terminate a container, but it is only your own. And why would you do that? Because something has gone awry. Something has gone, there is something afoot and you need to end that container and start a new one. So that's fine, you can do that. This is also where you can register and configure the notebook server web adapter. So here's an important thing to keep in mind. At 10.7, RJS Notebook Server is only single machine site, which means you're looking at getting a big machine if you're doing big things. In the future, at 10.7.1, which is only three short months away, and for us, even shorter because code freeze is weeks upon us, um, but notebook, the Notebook Server web adapter is pretty cool. What it does is it is smart enough to know where your containers are at and where these are on different nodes so you can be distributed across your different infrastructure. Now, what it does not do, because notebooks are running in containers, is that it does not distribute your actual workflow. So this is not like GeoAnalytics or Raster Analytics where I bring in a bunch of data and it uh, splinters it across different infrastructure. No, no, in this case, the multiple machines are to support multiple simultaneous users. If you want to do bigger work, you have bigger machines, bigger containers. 
And you can also access your ArcGIS notebook server directories from there. But now let's take a look. Let's go back here. Yep, you can still see it. Oops. ArcGIS notebook server portal. Uh, Bill, what am I missing? Mm -mm. Oh, I'll just, uh, it's, yeah, 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 I remember, I remember. I got it. There we go. DSX. Thank you, Bill. Everyone now met Bill Major. He has helped develop this project and is a wonderful human being and reminds me when I forget my web adapter names. Okay, so here we are in the beautiful admin API. If you've ever admired any of the other ArcGIS server admin APIs, you will find that this one is not leaving you wanting. It has all of the nice pink faded color that you could desire. Okay, let's go into the resources. Here is where we see our machines and we can find out more information about the hardware. So this lets me know kind of what this machine's running, number of processors, any of this. This is a good thing to know when you're starting to adjust the size of your machine because if, or the size of your containers because you can't make your container bigger than your machine. And you wouldn't want to, especially if you have multiple people wanting to use this system. Okay, so let's go back a little bit. Uh, let's take a look at notebooks. So here I can see different notebooks that are, been, are running on this machine right now. I can take a look at the different notebook runtimes that we have. I could restore factory runtime. So if I created a new one, so I wanted to add some new version of some new library that just came out, I create it, I put it in there, and it turns out I've made a horrible mistake and I really shouldn't have done that. I'm not saying it'll be you, but you know, it could happen. Don't worry, you can restore to factory defaults. That is what this button is for. If we take a look at systems, this is where it covers everything from looking at your license. So you can see I have advanced, when it will expire. I can mess with my web adapter. Here I can look at my container. I could choose to terminate my container if I wanted to, I will not. And then you can go into things like your properties. And here's where you can start changing things of your web socket size, any of that. So while this is entirely riveting, we will get back to our slides. Data wrangling. So this is one familiar thing that people typically like to do with notebooks because you have problems that you're trying to solve and as it turns out, these problems are extra problematic because not all the data is nicely in the exact format or location that you need it in. So what kind of data can you bring in? And the answer is almost anything. So you can bring in data in the cloud, you can have data in your enterprise geodatabases, for example, spatio-temporal big data store, and that applies too to raster data stores. So if you have data lakes, the way to get your data in from data lakes is to go through the spatio-temporal big data store. You can bring in 3D data, we saw the space-time cube, 2D data, you can bring in non-spatial data, of course. You can also work with local files. So this is where we saw, um, what we saw me working on. I guess I could go back and try to check on that, but we'll wait till the end now because we are actually out of time. Um, so if anyone leaves, I will understand. Okay, so working with local files, you saw the ability to bring it in. I explained about the private workspaces. Let's move on to analysis. You have the data science libraries. You have the Python API. You have ArcPy if you purchased advanced. You have the standard analysis tools. Geoanalytics, now you only have geoanalytics if you actually have a geoanalytics server. But from the notebooks perspective, you could have notebook standard, you could have notebooks advanced does not matter. It's just looking, does you have, do you have a geoanalytics server in your enterprise? Then there's raster analysis, same story here. If you have an image server with raster analytics, then you will be able to pull this in. And again, used with notebook server, standard or advanced. Now a very important question when it comes to it, when thinking about the size and scale of your deployments is where do these analysis jobs run? So the things that will run on the notebook server is anything that's using the Python API, ArcPy, 
or those open data science libraries. So your deep learning, your machine learning, that's happening here. If you're using the standard analysis tools, that's calling out to your hosting server. So that is where those jobs will run. If you're doing geoanalytics, it's calling out to the geoanalytics server. So that way it's, the job will run on geoanalytics server. The notebook is just getting it there. So that means that if you were to close your notebook and kill your kernel, once the job has made it to geoanalytics server, it will continue to run there. Now, if you had expected other things to happen after that, those things won't happen because you killed your kernel. But the getting it to geoanalytics server would continue. For image server, which is really talking about raster analytics, those tools run on that server as well. I can show you at the end what libraries come out of the box. It's in our doc, so we will have that. The samples. These are the different types of samples we have. If you're looking for administration, this is what we have at 10.7. And for each release, I would expect this to grow in different ways to cover the different workflows. At some point, we'll stabilize because we will have just done all of the things that you are looking to do. For content management, we have several notebooks covering everything from identifying insecure items to validating your registered data stores. And for data science and analysis, we have a whole bunch of notebooks and these will continue to grow. Um, I believe Rohit's Pavement Crack 1 is one that we're looking for at 10.7. And now, the roadmaps. I'm sorry I've had to rush through some of these slides, but 30 minutes is just not enough time for notebooks. So first, the roadmap of integration. 10.7.1 is when we will see ArcGIS Enterprise. Later this year, we're targeting July, but it could be the release after, Notebooks will come into ArcGIS Online, giving you a fully SaaS experience of ArcGIS Notebooks. Also later in 2019, I think this will be around the Q4 one, I, I don't know if that's November or what month that is, but we will see Notebooks in ArcGIS Pro. And the ArcPy team is showcasing this in their Pro Road Ahead session. So you can see a very, very early prototype. It doesn't show the Notebook UI yet because they made their screenshot before they came and checked with us. but you can expect the full notebook experience. And then 2020-ish, even in Insights. So Insights today talks about their Jupyter kernel gateway. And that's, that's good, but we want to take it a step further. And so that's where we can see ArcGIS notebooks coming in. And all while this is happening, we still have the ArcGIS API for Python. So you can still continue to go and get that and work with that independently of notebooks if you like. Now the product feature roadmap. And I'm not committing to any t dates or times on these things, but these are some of the things we're looking at in the future. Some very popularly requested ones are built-in notebook scheduling. So this one we're looking at probably around the 1072 timeframe, but again, subject to change. This will give you the ability to set a schedule for a notebook to run. So that way you can say, run this one time in the future at a certain date and time, or run this repeatedly every night at midnight you could do that. Sharing notebooks via distributed collaboration is expected to come in at 1071. More options within the notebook. Notice that I called my notebook untitled number, untitled notebook 38, I believe. Little things like that we plan on fixing. So you can just rename your notebook in the notebook without going to the items details page. Notice though that if you go through the create workflow, this won't be a problem for you. Uh, we already talked about multi-machine earlier today, so that is something that we're looking at for 1071. Publishing a notebook as a web tool. This one's going to be really exciting because it makes notebooks as a service, and it means that you can take what you're doing and even embed it as a widget in Web App Builder or make it accessible to GIS analysts through the Map Viewer. So cool stuff there. Um, that one, I would say we're looking at a couple releases out on that one. Uh, notebook server manager experience is one that we're looking at here in the next release. So 10.7.1, just a few short months away, we'll have not just the beautiful admin API, though you are completely welcome to continue to use that. And in many cases, you will need to, but a more built out server manager. The notebook app launcher workbench will be so amazing when it's built. We are gonna start designs on it very soon. But what this does is give you an experience where from the app launcher, you can click a button, or you just go straight to that URL, whatever's, a, whatever's your style, and there's everything you need for your notebooks. No navigating all through the portal to find your stuff. All of your notebooks, all of your samples, and maybe even in the future, notebook snippets. 
So we know that there's common things people want to bring in. You saw me bring in our analysis tools, but wouldn't it be great to bring in the bits of code that you know you want to be able to use repeatedly? So this is an idea that we're thinking about now is giving you the ability to just like today from Pro, you could create a web tool and publish that and search it from the map viewer, publish a, a notebook snippet and be able to find that and bring in that snippet. So that way you don't have to always rewrite the code or if you're like me, go back to the internet or go find Bill or any of the other, Ravi, go find them and say, I think this is broken. And they say, no, you actually misspelled a word. Um, and the last thing is versioning. Versioning is gonna be a little bit longer out because it's big. We know that when you're working with code, you wanna be able to version it. For this, some of the ideas we're having is around integration, maybe integrating with something like GitHub. So that, that way we can store and manage these. But getting that right takes time and takes testing. So look for that a little bit further out. But if along the way you have ideas that you think are really great and we need to hear, let people like me know. So that way we can make sure that we're incorporating them in our roadmaps and our plans. And with that, I appreciate you staying the seven minutes extra with me. You can fill out the survey and um, let people know Shannon went seven minutes extra. Give her seven minutes more. Um, and that's it. Thank you and have a great Dev Summit. <laughs>